Hi folks, Mr. Ackerman here. Thanks for watching. This is the supplementary video for Unit 5, Lesson 3. There's a lot to cover. It's a really important topic. The topic is uh, the law of conservation of momentum and conservation of kinetic energy, or elastic versus inelastic collisions. And this uh, is a very important tool in analyzing things that are going on, interactions in physics, especially when objects collide. And since everything in the universe really boils down to things colliding and interacting, that's why this is such an important topic. So let's get started. In G class, you're going to see um, there is the main video, which uh, you should have watched by now to have an idea of what I'm going to talk about. You've also got your lecture notes here. There's a series of other videos that I've uh, recently added in and I'm going to be talking about. And uh, before we get started with all that, we need to rewind to the Law of Conservation of Momentum lab that we've done. Uh, if this is during the COVID time, then these are collisions between carts that I'm doing in my home. But if it's uh, sometime in the future that we've uh, got back to normal and we're back in school, then we might be doing these on an air track. So I've mentioned that before, and you know what I'm talking about. So what I'm going to do now is jump into the lecture notes. And this is the first page that you're going to see where I just remind you that we've talked about the law of conservation of momentum, which applies when the net external force on a system is zero. Uh, in that case, the total momentum before, during, and after, at all times during an interaction, is the same. And remember, momentum is a vector quantity, so you have to consider direction. However, sometimes we can also look at the kinetic energy of a collision, and we might find that the kinetic energy before an interaction and after is the same as well. And if that's the case, we call the collision elastic. But if it's not the same, if it goes up or down for some reason, then we say the collision is inelastic. And we're going to look at some scenarios now. I'm going to go back to what we had in the Law of Conservation of Momentum lab. So I'm going to close this right now, and I'm going to jump down to those collisions that we did a while back, which look like this. So you'll remember that we had these four different scenarios of collisions and we analyzed the momentum and we saw that the momentum was conserved in a few of the examples but not the other ones. Scenario A was where there was a mass moving cart and then I suddenly added as gently as possible another mass. The momentum dropped substantially uh, although it wasn't the most disastrous loss but 23% loss. What I want to do now is look at the kinetic energy before and after the collision. So I'm going to move myself off to the side here so that you can see I've already run the calculations. In the beginning, the only thing that's moving is the cart. And so we calculate its kinetic energy using the numbers that you see here. Just put them into the 1 half mv squared formula. There's zero for the original uh, black mass, which isn't moving. And so you get this many joules. It doesn't seem like a lot of joules, but remember the number here is so low because the speed is very low but the speed is artificially low, if you remember, because we were watching a slow motion video, so the time, the denominator in distance over time, was very, very large. Anyway, because it's such a tiny number, I've written it in whole numbers, and I had to convert to an odd unit of measurement, the microjoule, but what you really care about is this number here. This is how much kinetic energy there was prior to the collision, or the interaction, then I do the same afterwards. Now, remember the mass gets combined, so I have m1 plus m2, and they move together so they have the same mass, and uh, same speed rather. And what you get here is 62 microjoules. So that's quite a loss. We went from 192 down to about a third of that. That's a big loss of kinetic energy. Very little kinetic energy remains. This interaction is what we call inelastic. Now, if I go to scenario B, this is the one where the carts originally started together with a spring that was loaded, and then I released them and they sort of flew apart in opposite directions. Here I didn't even bother doing much in terms of calculations, because you know right away the original kinetic energy was zero, nothing was moving. And then afterwards, they were moving. Now unlike the momentum, which was equal and opposite, and therefore the total cancelled, what we have here is kinetic energy, which is a scalar. We've got to add those. So I got red cart moving, blue cart moving. That's going to add up to a non-zero number. Here, I've actually gained kinetic energy. And my first question to you is, where did it come from? 
So where did the EK come from? Some of you might be thinking, doesn't this violate the law of conservation of energy? That thing says you can't suddenly create energy out of nothing. But if you think about this carefully, you'll see we haven't violated the law of conservation of energy. What's different is it's not the total energy that's changed, it's the kinetic energy, the K in there. And so where did the kinetic energy come from? Some other form of energy must have gone down if the kinetic energy went up. So I'll leave it to you to think about that. If you have questions, you can message me. Let's move on to the next collision. This was scenario C, where there was the red cart moving. It hit the stationary blue cart. The red cart essentially stopped afterwards, and the blue cart picked up all that momentum. So if you go back to the momentum calculation, you see we had a small drop in momentum, about 12% drop. 88% retained. If I talk about the kinetic energy, which I'll do just by moving myself to the side, I've run the calculations. We started off with about 429 microjoules of kinetic energy, and in the end, we had 343. Actually, we had a little bit more, because if you remember, the red cart didn't quite come to a stop at the end of the collision. Uh, it was moving, but it was moving so slowly, we really couldn't measure it carefully. So. What we do know is there's a little bit more than this much kinetic energy, not a heck of a lot. When you compare the two numbers, 429 versus 343, you see there's about a 20% loss. So this collision is, let's say, almost what we call elastic. Uh, there is a loss of kinetic energy, so it's not perfectly elastic, but it kind of reminds you of shooting uh, billiards. You know, if you're playing a game of pool and you, you hit the cue ball and it goes moving and it hits the target ball which then takes off and the cue ball stops. That's kind of a similar situation here. Uh, a pretty elastic everyday situation, although not perfectly elastic. And finally, there was scenario D where we had a collision where objects stick together. The momentum, if I recall, was nearly conserved. Yep, 12% drop, 88% conserved. But now, if I take a look at the kinetic energy, I see that in the beginning, I had 234 microjoules, and in the end, now remember, I've got to add the masses, and they move together so they have the same velocity. I have only 91 microjoules. That's a substantial loss. It's a 61% loss, and this is definitely a collision that we would call inelastic. And just a little bit of jargon here, when the objects stick together, we call it completely inelastic. Okay, I hope I can spell that. I hope you can read that. I've been drinking a lot of coffee and my hands are shaking. So, uh, when the objects stick together after the collision, we refer to that as completely inelastic. Uh, if we had total conservation of kinetic energy, we would call it perfectly elastic. And then there's all sorts of things in between where you just don't have conservation of kinetic energy. And the question is, where did the original kinetic energy go? Or in the case of an explosion like this one, where did it come from? It had to come from somewhere. So what I want to do is just jump back into today's lecture notes. So bear with me for a moment while I go to this and pull myself back to the side here so that you can see a little bit better. So We've now done page one here, and we're going to move on to page two. I've already discussed a few of these terms here and asked you to think about where the energy comes from or goes to in a collision. Some thoughts. If you think about scenario C, which is a classic car type of collision, like uh, during traffic, you know, someone's not watching where he's going and hits a car that's stopped at a red light, uh, the kinetic energy often goes into other forms, like you're going to hear noise, you're going, to, uh, you're going to permanently deform the metal in the car, for example, you're going to break things. All of this requires energy, it requires work to get done, and that comes from the initial store of kinetic energy. And in the case of scenario B, where the carts exploded apart, we have uh, what, what I commonly just refer to as an explosion type scenario, in the case of the spring, well, I had to compress the spring, remember a half kx squared, I had to do work in the beginning to store elastic potential energy, and so now that's coming back. And if it's the case of uh, a bomb exploding, for example, 
then if it's a, a chemical bomb like uh, like you normally see used uh, unfortunately in cases of warfare for example these would be there'd be stored potential energy chemical potential energy in the bomb which is ignited and it's released and then you get kinetic energy of the debris and thermal energy and sound energy and things like that so um, when we're in class together I have a VHS video which unfortunately I haven't been able to find on YouTube it's called the physics of football it's just from the uh, the 104 to the 108 minute uh, or hour mark of the video and uh, in it they talk about the game of American football where they're tackling each other and they talk about the energy involved in the momentum I really wish I could show this to you but I don't have the video with me I don't even have a VHS player so you're gonna have to uh, ignore this part of the lecture note for now when we're back together in class we will take a look at it so moving on there's a practice problem for you to do here in the lecture notes and uh, let's just take a quick look at it. We're not going to do it together because you can look in your solution manual to see how it's done. But there's a proton, so let's just draw this out. A proton, which is traveling at a certain speed. So let's call that V1 at 815 meters per second. Remember, those things zip around pretty quickly because they're pretty tiny. And uh, it collides head-on with the stationary proton. So there's another proton and it has, let's call it object number two, it's zero. So this is number one, and this guy is number two. Okay, remember, in this case, one and two does not mean initial final. Instead, prime is gonna be final. So these guys have a collision. Now they tell you that the collision is elastic. So they're telling you right away, guarantee EK total is going to equal EK prime total. Now, they don't tell you why that is, they just tell you that it is, and you're supposed to consider that as given information. So we can write that EK1, which is a half M1V1 squared, and EK2, which is a half M2V2 squared, that number is going to be the same as what happens afterwards. So what's happening afterwards? Well, I, I think we know for sure this object here, which isn't moving in the beginning, is going to start moving. So let's draw that, and let's write it as V2 prime, which we know is going to be this way, to the right. Uh, now, what's happening with this proton over here, V1 prime? I don't know. What do you think could happen? Uh, Pause the video for a moment and think about what could happen to that, that uh, proton. Okay, and now you've had a chance to pause it and you've come back. Let's think about it. It could um, stop completely, like in scenario C of the Law of Conservation of Momentum Lab. It could bounce backward and they both go in opposite directions. Uh, maybe it can hit and they both keep moving in the same direction. One thing that cannot happen though is the first proton can't keep moving with the same speed that it had in the beginning and I hope you can see why during the collision there is a Newton's third law force pushing backward on the initially moving proton and that's got to slow it down at least somewhat maybe it'll stop it maybe it'll reverse its direction at the same time proton number two can't just sit there it's getting a force forward and so it's got to at least pick up some speed. So I'm going to leave it here for you guys. You're going to write this out, and a couple of things are going to happen. One, you're going to find that there are two variables. And so with only one equation, you're not going to be able to solve what's, uh, what you need to solve for in this equation, uh, in this problem. And so you're going to need a second equation. And so you might be wondering, what is that second equation going to be? Well, think about it for a moment. Are the net force, is the net force on this system zero? I think if you think about it, you'll be able to convince yourself that it is. If these are two little protons in outer space, let's say, or even if they're on Earth, the force of gravity on a proton is tiny. It has a very tiny mass. And although it's there, it is so tiny compared to the force of the collision that we can safely ignore it and say, okay, the only force here is the force Newton's third law, 
on the two objects, which when they touch, of course, becomes an internal force. It cancels because it's equal and opposite. The net force is zero. And so the law of conservation of momentum is going to apply, which means you do have a second equation. But it's a vector equation. It's linear and it's vector. The EK equation is quadratic and it's scalar. You're going to combine these two the way you learn to in math class when you're solving systems of equation, equations. And because this one is quadratic, you're going to end up with potentially two solutions for the final velocity of this proton and therefore of this proton. Now we can't have two things going on in uh, a, a simple scenario like this, so you're going to have to pick one. And part of the thinking process here is choosing which is the appropriate uh, solution. So again, if you get stuck there, you're going to check the solutions in the solution manual or send me an email or message one of your friends and get that taken care of. All right, moving on. Here's another really cool application of the law of conservation of momentum and the relationship with energy, especially kinetic energy. It's called a ballistic pendulum. And uh, again, if we were together in class, I would be able to show you a demonstration of what this thing is. But instead, I've got two things. One, I had a student teacher one year who actually showed us this device in a video. It's posted on my YouTube channel. It's called Ballistic Pendulum, and if you just type in Rob Ackerman Physics Ballistic Pendulum, you'll see two separate videos, and I think you should watch what he does because it's kind of interesting. Uh, but I also found a good video that someone had posted, which is called Inelastic Collisions Ballistic Pendulum, and uh, if you search that in YouTube, you're going to get this video, which is actually quite interesting. Let's take a look at it because I have it here on YouTube. And I'd like to just watch it with you for a moment. I'm going to mute the sound. And I'm going to make sure the speed is normal. OK, it is. So let's play this. And what you're going to see, don't, don't, get, don't panic, but the guy's got a gun, which is, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't sound too good. The guy has a gun, which is um, attached to the table here. And watch what he does. He shoots the gun into a block of wood and the wooden block swings up. Now it's important that you know that the bullet gets stuck in the block of wood. It becomes embedded, so we have a completely inelastic collision. Now he films this in slow motion, and you see it swing up, and you can measure the height to which it goes. So do you see what's happening here? Can you figure out why he's doing this? We've got an E kinetic to E gravitational situation. It's a pendulum. But we've also got a collision, law of conservation of momentum. Does law of conservation of momentum applies? apply? What's the rule? The rule for it applying is if the net external force is zero, momentum is conserved. So the bullet comes out of the gun, it gets embedded. It exerts a first force forward on the block but the block exerts a force backward, they're in contact, so these cancel. Meanwhile, there's tension up, there's gravity down, the net force here is zero. So the momentum is conserved. That is a that basically sets up an equation that we can use in order to figure out what's happening as the bullet strikes here, because we then know that this swings up. So we've got E kinetic of the bullet block combination converting to E gravitational half mv squared to mgh. If you combine those two equations, these two ideas, you can work your way backward to find what's called the muzzle velocity, or the, or the speed of the bullet coming out of the gun. Because these bullets obviously move very fast. You can't, you, know, you can't do like a distance over time measurement unless you had a really, really uh, very, very good uh, slow motion camera, right? So this is how they used to figure out muzzle velocities, by looking at what a bullet does to some objects with known masses, seeing how they move. All the information about the bullet and the pendulum are given in the video, and I think you should watch this and give it a try in order to find the speed of the bullet. So that's what this question 7 on 253 is all about, and I think you should try it. Solutions are in the solution manual, and the 
It's question F, which is the numerical question where you actually do a calculation. Uh, parts A, B, C, D, and E are all leading you up to the correct equations to solve this. So give it a try. I think you'll enjoy it. It's a lab that we do in class, and I'll see if I can get the lab equipment so I can show you what it would have looked like. Unfortunately, I don't have it with me right now at home. It's in the school. All right, moving on a little bit further. Another interesting application of kinetic energy. You're all familiar with these helmets here. We see them in sports like hockey, for example. Uh, football would be another example. Riding our bikes or rollerblading or skateboarding, you wear them. What is it that they're doing? Well, if you ask someone on the street, what does a helmet do? It says it protects my head. Of course. But from a physics standpoint, how does it do it? Well, your head is moving when you fall off your bike, let's say, and before it strikes something, it's got kinetic energy and momentum. So we've got a natural link with what we're learning in the course here. Uh, some of the things that are important to remember is that, for example, a bike helmet, if you ever get in an accident, you're supposed to discard the helmet when you're done. You should never reuse a helmet ever again if you've hit your head with it. Why is that? Do they want to sell you more helmets? Well, of course they do, but that's not the reason. The reason is these helmets, if you look it up, they're built to break, but in a good way. And I don't want to tell you anything more because that's such a shocking statement that you would put something on your head designed to protect you, but it's designed to break. What's going on there? Think about it and maybe do a little bit of research and you'll find out. But not all helmets are designed to break. A bike helmet, yes. Hit your head in an accident, throw it away, buy a new one. But what about a hockey helmet? These guys playing hockey, they get hit all the time, many times per game. If they had to throw away their helmets every time they got hit, they would be going through helmets like every few minutes. So these helmets are designed not to break. They're different. If you've ever worn one of these things, maybe you know that the inside of the helmet is soft and squishy. Whereas the inside of a bike helmet is hard. So that's a key difference. What is that doing in terms of the physics? I'll give you a hint. Think of impulse. Remember we learned about that in lesson number one. Also think about, when you're thinking about bike helmets, think about this. Where does the kinetic energy go? And why would these be breakable? And if you want another hint, if you like car racing, especially, you know, my wife loves Formula One car racing. I love it too. It's really, really exciting. If When those cars get in an accident, they break into so many pieces that go flying all over the course. That's another hint. They're actually designed to break, although they are designed around a cage that is meant to protect the driver. So there's an interesting link here with F1 racing, which is super cool. If you ever want to look into that, there's tons of physics in there. Look into all this, and then you'll be able to answer question 6 on 248. There's even an interesting question here about why you shouldn't ever wear a helmet that doesn't fit properly. I mean, I guess if you had the choice between no helmet and something, maybe it would be okay. I don't know about that. Don't hold me to it, but uh, just an idea. But you should always go for one that has a proper fit if you can. Why is that? Well, there's a concept which I'll... It'll, you'll recognize this if you're in chemistry. Force divided by area equals pressure. So that's uh, force is in newtons and area is in square meters. You've learned about pressure in chemistry. The units are newtons per square meters. There's pascals as well, which is some combination of that. Um, why do you think the force of an impact and the area over which it spreads on your head would matter. Here's a link to think of as well. If you ever learned, if you ever took swimming lessons, you might have learned about ice safety. They used to teach me uh, about ice safety in swimming lessons. And they'd say, if you're ever skating on a frozen pond uh, and you fall through the ice, here's what to do. And better yet, here's a way to avoid falling through the ice. They used to say, if the ice is cracking, then you should lie down and spread your body out so you spread out your weight. And I think you kind of understand this. If you were on a, a creaky dock that was about to collapse into the water, you'd kind of get down and spread yourself out, and maybe the dock wouldn't collapse, and you could kind of crawl to safety. Same idea here. Your body is exerting a gravitational force down, 
by increasing the area over which that force is applied, you diminish the pressure and the dock doesn't break or the ice doesn't break and you don't fall in. How is a helmet like that, especially when it fits properly? And how are you sort of circumventing that safety feature of a helmet if you wear one that isn't properly fitting? Okay, so enough said, we'll move on. One last thing uh, for this, I'm just gonna pull myself over here. This is another one of those challenging questions, a Sir Isaac Newton contest question. In this one, there's basically two frictionless carts that are coming toward one another. One of them has a spring bumper. Now, this one with the spring bumper is a little bit lighter, but it's moving faster than the slightly heavier one, which is moving slower. The question that you're gonna read about is how much does the spring compress at its maximum compression? And so you're probably thinking, oh, I know what happens. The kinetic energy goes into elastic potential energy and you would be right. There is an EK to EE thing going on here. But if you try that and you look for the solution, well, you've got multiple choice because that's how the Sir Isaac Newton contest works. You're gonna get the wrong answer if this is the only thing you think about. And uh, I believe the correct answer is D. So look to get that. But I think if you do this just by thinking of this, you're gonna get something like E or C. I can't remember which one it is. Why is it? Well, because a lot of students think that this is the case and they make a mistake. And so one year to show my students that they were actually making a mistake, I created a slow motion YouTube video simulation two carts, one of them with an extra little bit of mass taped on it to simulate this one, this one moving slowly, and this one over here moving faster. And I made it into a YouTube video. Here it is. It's on my YouTube channel. It's called Elastic Collision Between Unequal Masses. It's in today's lesson. And I don't want to say anything more. I just want you to watch it when you have a chance. It just very slowly shows the two objects coming toward one another and it shows the spring compressing. And I'm gonna pause this before we reach the, uh, the, the, the moment that matters, because I want you to think about this a little bit more. And that's about it. So sorry for the long one, but like I said, this is a very important concept and there's a lot related to it. So let's see you go through the work, the practice problems and the unit schedule. If you have questions, you know where to find me and uh, I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.